Today we're looking at miracles from the mundane to the miraculous. Join us on Our Jewish Roots with Bible teaching from Israel with Dr. Jeffrey Seif, coming up right now. To believe in the Bible is to believe in miracles. From Genesis to Revelation, the impossible became possible. As God's hand moved across space and time, land and seas were created, graves opened, water turned to wine, the sick and lame healed, the land of Israel completely restored. Past, present, and future is the Alpha and Omega. He is the God of miracles. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. I'm Jeffrey Seif. Well, we're nearing the end of this wonderful series, The God of Miracles, and we challenge you today that if you've not seen them all, there's a good way to, to see those, yes? Right, levitz.com or levitz.tv. That will get you all of the past programs easy. You can sit and binge watch them if you would like to. I think there's value in looking at miracles, by the way, because it builds up faith. A lot of people have so many problems in the world, and. People wonder, oh God, can you help me? Well, you, you get exposed to this and you know the answer is yes, you can. And you have uh, miracles in the physical realm today. I mean, ones that you can see and touch. Those are good, interesting miracles, aren't they? Yes, we have in this program, in this series, personal testimonies. Uh, we take people to Bible places where God did amazing things and it's so good to experience all that. Builds up faith and we need faith for troubled times. We do, and you're talking about the first, should I say, recorded miracle. It was a wedding feast. Yeah, the first one noted in the Gospel of John. And that harks to a point you made elsewhere in the series. God does little things. There he is concerned about a wedding and there was a certain specific need there where the God of the universe is interested in helping them even with that. And he obeyed his earthly mom. He obeyed his earthly mom to care about people in their mm -hmm. earthly business, not just people having a wedding in Cana, but people that have felt need help and are having problems all over. He can help with the little things. That's good. We take you to that spot in Israel right now with Dr. Seif's teaching. Wedding ceremonies can be complex events. This indeed was true in John chapter two. As you might recall, there was a problem with food and beverage. Beverage management wasn't doing so good. I mentioned that because as this thing is going on, someone reports to Yeshua, his own mother no less, look, the, the wine has gone out, we have a problem. Big day, a wedding. Coming to you from Israel here, a wedding venue no less, I'm reminded of the fact that, again, these things can be very complex. Someone wasn't sufficiently prepared for the moment, and the net result is there was a need at a critical time. You might be at a place in your life where there's been a lack of preparation. The net result is there's a critical need. Well, this is a program on miracles, and I'm not interested in inventing miracles much as I am beckoning individuals to return to the stories where they see that miracles and deeds take place. I mentioned that here, they didn't have any wine. Yeshua, however, had them pour water. And the miracle was, is the water was poured. And it was transformed into wine. The word transform, metamorphe, metamorphosis. Uh, transform from the Latin, trans means to cross over. That is to say, water crosses over into a new kind of form. Now, when individuals take it in, they're surprised. As the wedding feast is going on, apparently uninterrupted by this, this was a problem behind the scenes. And you know, when you have a business, there can be a lot of problems behind the scenes. This is a problem behind the scenes, and what happens then as the, uh, the wedding event continues and the fruit of the vine, you know, some say it was fermented, some not, don't want to get into that. Whatever it was, it was water, and then it was some grape substance after that. The point is, those who experience the new beverage says, look, everyone brings out the good wine first, and then when they're drunk, the worse, but you reserved the good until now. 
You ever heard the expression, the best is yet to come? That which came later came better. They say usually there's some trickery. You start off with a good wine and then you cheapen it when people can't notice it. Now, people have been known to do some creative things at wedding. I'm guilty as charged. In my own wedding with Barry, we had 500 in attendance. I asked, how much is a wedding cake for 500 people? I found out. Well, after that, I opted for a big tiered wedding cake. Everything was fake except the top one that you cut. So what happens is we go there, we cut, and then they take it out, and I ordered loads of Costco. No one knew the difference. They were saying, oh, the cake. Listen, they said, look, this is beautiful. This is wonderful. They didn't know the difference. Here, there's no trickery involved. I wasn't involved in the wedding. The point of this story is even if there's a problem because someone doesn't prepare, there's a God that can do even far more abundantly than people can ask and think. And I want you to know that God didn't go out of business. And by the way, this is a problem, but it's not a critical need. It's not someone who's paralyzed or blind from birth. It's a wedding for goodness sake, but God even cares about the special moments of our lives because he cares about us. We're looking at miracles as a, there's an example of one here. In the next segment, there's another one, and we'll be examining throughout. And the reason why I want to do it is I want you to know that God loves you. And yes, he can even have a miracle for you. It really is a thrill for me to be here. Who wouldn't be happy about it? Israel, the Holy Land. And in this series, it's a great joy to be able to speak to you to, for, and about miracles because they're so significant in biblical literature from one end of it to the other. And there's such need for it. You might need one in your life right now. I'm coming to you from a place where someone really needed it, Bethsaida. You might recall the place from John chapter 5. A man had been paralyzed for a long, long time, and he got his healing here. And I mean here. I'm here in the pool. Of course, there's no water. A few thousand years have passed. But this is the place. And there's crusader, you know, buildings round about it. But this is the place. It's a fascinating place, a fascinating story, some story that means something to me personally. And I mention that because I was paralyzed from the neck down. Years ago, I contracted a very rare disease called Guillain-Barre. Some call it Gillian Barr. I was paralyzed from the neck down. I had to learn to walk again. I was in the hospital for months, outpatients for a number of months. And I remember when I first got sick, I was afraid because I couldn't move. And I said, oh my God. First, I was afraid I was going to die. And then I was afraid I wasn't. I didn't want to live like that. Well, obviously, I'm not living like that. God intervenes. I want to talk to you about miracles. I want to open up the book, take a look at John chapter 5, and I want to look at a story that's very important, not just for me, but I think it's important for you. Let's have a look at the book, but I'm going to go to another part of the pool. I want to take a moment and set up this story because it really is a good one. I mean, they're all good, but like I said, this one's very personal for me. We're looking at the fifth chapter in the Gospel of John. We're told we're by a place, Bethsaida. We're here now. And there was a crowd of invalids assembled there. And there's one guy, we're told in verse 5, who was invalid for 38 years. That's a really long time to be paralyzed in a bad way. That's really a long time. Now, Jesus asked him something, and, and, and it's, I don't want to get in trouble with the boss for this, that is God. Jesus asked him something. I mean, it sounds like a dumb question. Uh, Jesus comes up to him and he says, do you want to be healed? Nah, I, I just think I'll lie around for 37 years. You know, I just think I'll lie around. It's all good. Like I said, I don't want to get in trouble with the Lord for it, and I'm just saying for, it, for a fact, you would think, uh, that uh, of course he would. And I get the impression if the Lord asks a question, it's not that he doesn't know the answer. There's something else behind it because he can read the heart. But the point is if someone wants a miracle, they have to be willing to declare it 
and go after it. It's not going to happen by accident. So he says to him, do you want to be healed? In verse 6, subsequent to which the man answers respectfully, sir, I'm paralyzed, I can't move. And, uh, you know, I'd like to get it, but I can't seem to get to it. And then Jesus says something to him in verse 8 that has been repeated many times, many days and many ways. He says, get up, take up your mat and walk or rise take up your pallet and walk. You know, there are a lot of people, they're just stuck in stuff and they get used to it, you know, but th th that, that, that seizing the moment and getting up. It's a fascinating story. In fact, the oldest above ground church that has been unearthed tells the story in plaster in the walls of the church. There's a fellow there or a person in, in, in a Latin toga and he's pointing his hand, and it says in Latin, rise, take up your pallet, and walk, and there's a guy underneath who's picking up his bed mat and walking away. It's an early second century depiction of the story that we're reading right now. I mentioned this, Jesus uh, healing paralyzed people is a story that has resonated in culture. You find it in art, you find it in literature, we find it replicated here, and why is that? The body is frail. Things can happen to it. I know that as I make my journey from the womb to the tomb, sickness can happen. People can get bested by circumstances in their body. It happens. And paralysis is, is one of the, the worst examples of it. In the Newer Testament, Jesus raises a lot of paralyzed people. He does that. It's like a favored miracle. And it's not just that he'll do it for physical people physically, but a lot of people are paralyzed in life in different ways. They're just really stuck, and they can't get extricated from their circumstance. Isn't it good to know there's miracle power that can even get the better of that? And that's the story in the Gospel of John. In the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus said, if I do not do the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even if you don't believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. In other words, let the miracle be the, the calling card. The miracle is the proof for the one who is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And if you're at a place in your life when you hear about miracles and you say you need one, I want you to know you can get one. And I'm telling you that story from a place where someone got one a long time ago. God is still in the miracle business today. Hopefully you've had a miracle in your life. I know that you have. What an amazing testimony that you have. You were paralyzed. I can't even fathom that. Yeah, it was weird. It definitely was, to tell you the truth. And uh, I experienced a feeling uh, of, of deep despair, and the Lord raised me up out of that. So were you asking for that healing? Yes, Okay. and, and fighting for it. Uh, you know, at first I was afraid I was going to die, and then I was afraid I wasn't, because I really didn't want to live in a body like that. And it really was a, a dark space, quite frankly. I, I never knew about that. I don't think we, either no. of us until you just shared that. Yeah, I had picked up an exotic disease and um, I was rendered literally paralyzed from the neck down. I remember it vividly like it was yesterday, but it was a lifetime ago, you know. Can 27. I ask how old you were when that happened? It was about, well, I'm 67 now. This was 27 years ago or so. And uh, uh, it, was, it was really scary. I, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to. Like I said, at first I thought I was going to die. I can live with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I can live with the fact I'm going to die. Right. But I, I, I couldn't live with the fact that I was going to be living in a dead body. And I'm a real intense kind of person. But, but thanks be to God that, that uh, the Lord helped me get the better of that. Can and we he, ask if it was a slow progression in your miracle or was it instantaneous? Well, I was in the hospital working on it, but it was very, very deliberate. I... Uh, I heard the words, rise, take up your pallet and walk, and I just got up and walked. Wow. Just like that. In fact, a medical doctor, uh, a friend of mine, uh, had just left the room. He was visiting. He wasn't my attending physician. And I remember I was in the bed, and I thought, oh, I've never felt more tired in all my life. And then, rise, take up your pallet and walk, and I got up. 
and just started walking. And I was afraid to get back in the bed. I was just walking around the hall. It looked weird because the muscles were all weak. Wow. <laughs> and and uh, but I was afraid to, to stop walking because I was afraid if, if I went and got it back in the bed, I wouldn't be able to get up again. <laughs> I didn't want this to be a fluke. And it really was, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dark space, you know, when, when people are really sick, they're really in a, in a lonely stretch of highway there. And uh, I'm thankful to God that, that he visited me in that place. I don't think anyone wants illness, but there is something about having a physical situation or problem or disease that gives you compassion and understanding that you wouldn't have unless you walk through it yourself. Absolutely, you know, just as, as a minister, visiting people in the hospital, I really feel it, you know, and they can feel it if you feel it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm really there in the moment in a way. You couldn't be there if you're young and healthy. But there's something about being older and a little beat up that uh, gives you a frame of thinking. Well, we're thankful that you had your healing ministry, ministry, well, you do have a ministry, but your miracle and that you're with us today. And, and thank you for sharing that personal story because we didn't even know that was part of your story. Glad your to life. do it. I, I wanted to do this series on miracles in part because a lot of people need a miracle mm -hmm. and I want people to know they can get it. Mm -hmm. I will say this, you heard that small voice and I just want to say to you, listen to that small voice. It's there for you. We'll be right back. Our resource this week, the series, The God of Miracles on DVD. In this nine part series, we show our miraculous God at work from Genesis to Revelation with teaching from the Holy Land by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. We also hear testimonials from those who have experienced the Lord's supernatural hand in their own lives. Contact us and ask for the God of Miracles series on DVD. Remember to connect with us on social media for so much extra content. Find us at Our Jewish Roots. If you are a faithful follower of Our Jewish Roots, you know that there's so much more that we offer, not just this program that you're watching today, but our cabin chats that we bring you. One that we really love is the Bearded Bible Brothers. We hope you've seen them. They're so cute. <laughs> and speaking of our wonderful Bearded Brothers, Caleb, who is our gentle giant, I hope you've seen him before on his program, got the chance to interview a mother who faced a very difficult decision, and she chose life. On day three, she had a brain bleed, but we really didn't know about the brain bleed until she was 12 days old when her forehead was enlarging. Oh, and I went to visit her in the NICU and the nurse sent me straight across town to the doctor's office. We sat down in the doctor's office and the doctor said, oh, we have done an ultrasound on your daughter. She has um, hydrocephalus, which is water on the brain. Mm -hmm. There are ventricles in our brain that um, nourish and take away waste and help developing brains and hers were filling with fluid. Mm. And so the doctor went on to say that um, because of this, there's, she has risk of brain damage. There's mm. a lot of pressure in, in her brain. And that um, there's a way to relieve the pressure and it's through a process of called shunting. In shunting, mm. they would put a tube into the ventricle of her brain, thread the tube under her skin mm. and have it end in her abdomen so that the water would be absorbed by her body. He said that such an operation is quite risky it's risky for several reasons is because uh, the shunt can cause it, the operation uh, can cause infection yes. and then it's infection in the brain. A shunt can become clogged and mm -hmm. then it needs another operation to unplug the shunt. And as Jill grew, this is a lifelong thing that she may be needing. Mm -hmm. They would need to remove the shunt and put a longer one in oh, wow. because of her growth. And then he went on to say that, um, that because of this, because of either the operation or the pressure that already in her brain with the hydrocephalus, this is what her prognosis was. She would never walk. She'd be wheelchair bound for the rest of her life. She would, in his words, mm -hmm. be retarded and not to be able to communicate with us. She would need 24 hour seven care. She would probably be blind. She would most likely be deaf. And that um, the best thing for her would for us to stop feeding her. Well, that is terrible. 
<laughs> that is the doctor who told you this. Yeah, I he was He gave shocked. you a, a bad report and then he, he offered to basically kill your baby for you. That's what I said. Um, you mean she's going to die? And he said, ma'am, you need to understand this is going to be a hardship for you. It's going to be a big financial hardship because her care will be expensive. Mm -hmm. It will be a hardship on your marriage, on your future family, um, children, on the son that you have because you're spending all your time and energy and money on one child with low quality of life. You know, my wife, she, uh, for the last 12 years, she's worked as a nurse in high-risk pregnancies and deliveries and things just like this. Um, and it's, it's hard, but I've never, you know, heard until reading your story, hearing your story from you, that a doctor would ask that. That a doctor would say, here, let's take care of that for you, as if that's a problem. This is your child. You love your child. And that goes, I know it goes against everything in your, in your body, in your heart, as a believer as well. Am I right? Oh, I'm right. I, I just said, no. Yeah. No, this is a child of God, and you do everything you can to save her life. That's right. Mm. And so they weren't going to do the shunt right away. They decided to put her in diuretics first mm -hmm. to try to draw the fl um, fluid off of her brain. But every week she got an ultrasound. And the ultrasound did not show any decrease in the ventricles of her brain. Mm. So when she was seven weeks old, the doctor said, um, we're going to schedule a shunt for surgery. But first we want to do a CAT scan so we have a more clear picture of what we're doing. And um, we will meet with you tomorrow morning. So my husband and I went the next morning to the hospital. And the doctor came in with his films and put on that big light box. And first he mm. put up the film that showed the ultrasounds. And yes, the ventricles were large, even to a non-medical eye. Yeah. They looked like rivers of water oh, in her wow. brain. But then he put up the CAT scan from the previous day. And the front, front ventricles were normal sized. And the back ventricles were only slightly larger than normal. Wow. And he said, um, these ventricles are okay at this size. It's not causing pressure on their brain. And, and this is an absolutely amazing thing. And my husband said, well, this is the miracle we have been praying That's for. Right. Amen. And the doctor said, call it what you want, but it's never happened without surgical <laughs> intervention. Doctors never want to admit that, do they? That was, <laughs> it was someone outside of them that caused that. But you, that's a miracle. There's no other way to describe it. No other way. We had many churches praying mm -hmm. in many states, and and we had our daughter. Well, thank you, Jesus. And your daughter's here today yes, with us right beside you. Yes. This is Jill. <laughs> I'm a miracle because God wanted me to be. That's right. God gets all the credit. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. You just got to meet Jill. Next week, you get to hear her story. She has experienced a miracle. And I've got to jump back a few minutes in our program to an absolute miracle, Jeff, that you mentioned. It's a miracle that you actually served Costco cake at your wedding reception. Then they ate it. Well, you know, <laughs> they didn't know the difference. That's a miracle. We knew you were brilliant, but that's no, brilliant. And we knew you were cheap. The, those but that's big cakes really are cheap. a fortune. You know, just <laughs> I just cut the top of it. Everything else was Costco. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. I, that, but now, that's a but miracle. Yeah, thank you. Now words out. Oh, you shared it before I did. Yeah, but you're pushing the point. They might have <laughs> forgotten. But we we appreciate your honesty in the cake and also honesty about what you walked through in your physical miracle. And you're welcome for that cake one. Thank you. I know you're going to get me back for it. <laughs> no, 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 no. But thank you for what you shared, and thank you for watching our program today. All of you make this happen. When you give of your heart, when you give of your prayers, and when you give financially to this ministry, we can keep getting the good news out literally around the world. So we, from this set, thank you so much. I also just want to say we would love for you to join us on a tour to Israel. You can find all the information on levitt.com. We're going to leave you today with a song from our founder, Zola Levitt. But before we do that, it's time to go. A word from the Bible. Yes. Shalom, shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.
into wine, water into wine. I wish that you had been there, water into wine. Oh, can you imagine anything so fine? There, as I was married, water changed to wine. And Jesus. On water, change water there for me. He gave me living water, he gives as one divine. He changed my pain to love like water into wine. Water into wine, water. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs, the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter, which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online, or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store. There you can order this week's resource, or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries helps us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember, we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.